Can you just start with your name and how long have you lived here in this area? Okay. Um, my name is Dickie Belton. That's my given name. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, I've been coming here uh, on the Klamath here out of Happy Camp since 96. And uh, I worked up, lived up in, uh, in Depot Bay, Oregon um, that year, most of my life and back and forth. But um, did uh, was a timber faller logging um, and went to college, graduated in forestry. Um, I had commercial fishing boats, so worked on commercial crab boats and fishing boats. And then I started teaching forestry in high school, Willamina High School. And then I switched uh, to, um, it was called um, Student Assistance Facilitator. Uh, I was a drug and alcohol counselor. And so I went yeah. through courses in that. And so in the summers I did uh, gold dredging and, and, and commercial fishing and um, designed an independent living program. So kids got paroled to me and I used them in the fishing. I used them in uh, gold mining and uh, and so that was part of the program and so there wasn't a program but they accepted what i i wrote up the program and so they called it youth offender foster care oh, wow. and i got paid pretty good and they lived with us as 24 7 very wow. successful until some of the younger people took over the youth authority oregon youth authority and they um and everything I did was off limits. They said, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And around water, no being around water, no on the boats, uh, mm -hmm. no filleting fish. They were making good money. Mm -hmm. Every kid that was in my home, if they graduated our program, had their restitution paid and um, a money in the bank. Really? Did you take any youth out gold mining? All the time. Yeah. We brought them here. And, and, and actually, back when we could still dredge, there were miners paying them to help haul the dredges in and out, wow. you know, and it was just a, it was a time here when they're totally out of their element and just having a good time. I would interview the kids. Uh, we were licensed for five, had a farm, you know, and all that stuff, a little sawmill, uh, not this one, a different one. Yeah. And uh, the kids just had so much to do. I had them on the, on the boats and there were commercial people that would hire them and um, charter boats would hire them and then I would bring them here and they would meet people from all over because back then we had people even from England and uh, actually went to England we met them my wife and I met them we went to England and spent Christmas at their house on the Rhine River wow. we met them here uh, so we do have a lot of we mean the 49ers we yeah. have a lot of uh, uh, used to until they outlawed everything yeah you know? So about what time, when when did you start to see things change from a regulatory standpoint as far as the rules regarding placer mining or recreational uh, You know, um, everything I did, they outlawed. You know, I had a long truck and loader and then the spotted owl came along, you know, and, mm. and we know that that was all fake, you know. Yeah. It was just done for monetary reasons for some people, but they just... All they do is they just um, infiltrate the hippies, and that's my term for environmentalists, yeah. the tree huggers. They infiltrate them, get them all stirred up. Then they stand back, and they get all that stuff done, and they don't have to pay anything. Really? You know, and that shuts down whatever they want to shut down. Uh, that's my opinion, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's a very educated opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, about as soon as the dredging moratorium came up, you know, we had, um, I believe it was the Sierra Fund who got a hold of the locals here, the Karuk tribe, and um, got them to sue uh, the, uh, the state of uh, California. Mm -hmm. And then the moratorium came. Um, I think the logging in that started, I saw that, I graduated in 1980, and I saw that in forestry. I saw uh, uh, the, my last year in college, I saw uh, several young students come in that hated logging, hated wood, hated, uh, they just really, they were really there to take over and change everything. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's what it seemed to me. I remember when I graduated, I told my wife, I said, oh man, when these kids graduate and become foresters, we're in trouble because their management practices aren't for sustainability. Mm -hmm. It's for um, exclusion. Right. And that's what I saw. And, you know, the Spotted Owl just started at that time. And uh, being part of some of the, um, you know, 
actually the summers I did pre-sale timber and fire. Mostly I was on fires because it was the summers. And I could see a change, the younger people coming in, big change. Yeah. You know, we had a sign that said, if it's wood, it's good. And they vandalized it. Those are students, you know, yeah. and I'm like, what? Do you? So anyway, we won't get into that. I just know that's when it, I saw it starting was about 1980. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, you know, that was right around the spot at Owl Time, and then it just it went a group called Our Ocean and a group called um, KS Wild, and they're just being funded by people who do not want America being America. Right. So there's still a lot of gold in this, is in this river, huh? 90% of all gold recovered is still here. So you figure if 10% taken out 90 percent is left it's just yeah. constantly replenishing mm -hmm. it's constantly uh i mean there's places where i know has been heavily mined in the 1800s and early 1900s and the dredgers go in there and there's it, it just a lot of gold we're talking some of them are like 13 ounces a week wow you know and then you all of a sudden we, we can't mine for a while and people with masks and snorkels are going down in and they're finding 10 ounces wow. that one it's in our one of the 40 new 49ers um i think it's in the last june's newsletter and mm -hmm. the kid that got it him and his wife and their kids are living in a little uh, trailer and they were out up off of Savage Rapids and he was raised here, dredged with his dad and that and he just went out in the middle of the river, staked up, we got pictures of it, staked up his sluice box and dove and just shoveled into his sluice box. He hit a pocket and got 10 ounces, yeah. bought him a motor home and yeah. all that stuff, you know. So and, uh, what's the big difference between mining, you, <clears throat> when you say the 1800s, the, the original miners that came here, we you know they did a lot of, you know, harm to the, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm the forest and the way they mine the techniques what's the difference today and the technological advances compared to then well in the old days if you look at all the pictures around here from even up to the 1920s and 30s there were no trees yeah. you know i mean there were back in the hills and but it, i mean they literally went through and and um, a lot of the um, small canyons that we have here i know where they're at those are man-made you know mm -hmm. if you go on google earth you know where um, Wingate, mm -hmm. so and then up above Wingate, where I think you had a claim right there on, yeah. on Oak, Oak Flat Creek. Yeah. Well, if you look from Oak Flat Creek to Wingate and just kind of focus your eyes right from Google Earth, you can see the trees growing in a in a circular motion, um, and you can see all of the hydraulic mining from there all the way down past Wingate, back up on the opposite side of the road. It's just it's just hydraulic mine after hydraulic mine after hydraulic mine. Mm -hmm. And um, they just hosed all of that into the uh, river there. So, and they didn't recover a lot of the gold. I mean, they did, but the methods that they were using. Now, you could hydraulic mine on the Klamath River until, I think, 1963. Oh, wow. um, uh, the reason they shut it down in the Sierra Nevadas and in the, in, in up out of uh, Sacramento and the Valley was because of all the mining, all the uh, farming. So... Oh all of that silt going into the river run down and it was killing the crops and stuff. So they outlawed hydraulic mining in the um, um, east of say um, Chico all the way down to um, Vallejo and that. So all of that east was outlawed because of ruining the farmland. Well here there was no farmland and it, they say that it was damaging the fish and all of that but yeah. that was um, and really it tapered off about probably here, the hydraulic mine tapered off right about end of World War I. So 1920s, 1930s, it's just a lot of people just never came back. Then World War II came and a lot of people just never came back. Gold prices were really low. You could make more money working in the mill right. than you could mining. So right. uh, it just kind of tapered off. And then all the trees grow back. So you think hydraulic mining, let's just say um, 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. A hundred year old tree is pretty good yeah. size. When did suction dredging start to become a thing? Uh, you know, I'm not exactly sure when it started. I know um, I first started mining uh, up out of Marysville and then um, South Yuba River, mm -hmm. North Yuba River, up in the area, up in there around Smartsville, Timbuktu, and those. And I was just panning. I got, I went and had some dive tanks, and I'd go down and just hand mining. So I knew some people that were dredging then mm -hmm. up above um, Bridgeport. So I've got a lot of nice gold just hand mining out of Bridgeport. So how I found Happy Camp was 
This would have been um, 1996, it was. And I got married, my wife and I, and I said, so we go up there to do our mining at Bridgeport, and it's now a national monument. Mm. We couldn't eat, we only use a, our hand and a gold pan. They said, nothing oh, else, no, no tools at all, you know? And I'm like, whoa. So somebody told us about Happy Camp, which I kind of knew where it was, but so we came here in 96 and joined. Mm -hmm. And we were mining here, had our dredge, and you know, we brought a lot of kids here, you know, and yeah. I did some excellent stuff, you know, with, with uh, the with our own kids and our grandkids, and uh, but the the boys that I had paroled to us, and uh, and then that all ended. The moratorium came about. Uh, I knew it was taking place whenever. Um, it's a long story. You can find it in some of the of the mining magazines when Dave first got accused of putting mercury in the in the ground. Is it, I mean, let's be honest. In today's you know mining world, is it, that's not a common practice. Is oh mercury? shoot! You know, I will tell you what. I know the two two EPA scientists, uh, uh, um, Claudia Weiss and Joseph Green. Mm -hmm. Ten years they did. A six inch dredge. Um, I know them really well. Um, they were with the um, Minerals and Mining Advisory Council, and then I joined up for Northern California representative. So I know a lot of the information. They did a 10 year study with a six inch dredge. They were everywhere. They even went places where nobody's ever mined. They did turbidity in, turbidity out, and, and, and that 2% that of all if done right, anyway, just, just everything 80, but 2% exited the dredge. Wow. And through the outfits that do not want anybody mining, uh, two percent wasn't enough. Yeah. So they were they wanted to shut it down. It could they could care less about yeah. um, what the environment was doing. With so at uh, the end of the day, a dredge running on the river, there's less mercury after right, right, they right, right, dredged right. than when they right. started. I remember before any of this issues happened. Um, I won't even tell you the river I was on. But I hit a, a pocket of uh, cinnabar rock, and you can't have mercury. Uh, I could be wrong. I'm not that much of a geologist, but you find a cinnabar rock um, a mine or a cinnabar rock, you're going to find mercury because they come together. Okay. So I got like um, I we didn't have internet then. I just kind of looked up, and if you heat it, the mercury comes out of it. You know, yeah. so I had a, like a half of a five gallon bucket. Uh, a lot of cinnabar rock, these little pieces, big pieces, and I kind of hammered it up and the mercury was already coming out. And I heated it up and a lot of mercury came out. Oh. So I had to leave the spot I was dredging because everything in my dredge was covered in mercury and it's hard to extract and there was gold there, but some of that spot, you know, there was, it looked like a mirror, pockets mm. of it down whenever I rolled the boulders in that. Mm. Okay, well, now, people will say, yeah, you disturbed that. I will guarantee you this, Ben. I had, uh, when I told you about the uh, that documentary from the University of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. they came up here in the summertime, Rattlesnake, and I had them down there, and they did an interview, and I was telling them kind of what I'm telling mm -hmm. you about um, that um, what I just told you. Well, they came in November. They wanted to come in the wintertime. Well, it was really cool because we had like a 13-foot flood. So I took them to the same spot. They had just the camera set up, and it was raining. And and um, and the producer, she was a nice lady. She wasn't. She didn't act like she was trying to do one way or another. She just wanted to know the facts. So I, as, whether I'm telling you a fact or not, I'm telling you what I see. You know, and that I see as a fact. So we go there, and it's like the boulders were banging and bouncing. You could hear them. You know, you know, rattlesnake, it's yeah. just that it looks like there's a jet underwater just boiling it up. So and they were going, I said, you hear that? That's boulders bouncing. What happens is, is that water is so swift that it just it, it peels up the under those boulders and then poof, the boulder rolls and then it peels up and the boulder rolls. Well, then magnify that with every boulder there on this kind of a flood. Now, this is a a 13 foot flood so there are floods that were bigger than this mm -hmm. and so they were like we were 13 feet down there. i said yeah we were down there this summer so 
I said to the lady, she said, so that must stir up a lot of, and I said, you hear bedrock. You can hear boulders hitting bedrock. I said, you could have a six inch dredge, eight inch dredge, 10 inch dredge, I don't care. You could have them from I-5 all the way 150 miles to the end of this down at Witchpeck or go clear the ocean and run those dredges constantly. You can't compete what you've seen here in 15 minutes. So you, whenever the environmentalists say you're stirring up the mercury and they'll say, well, yeah, but that's natural. What difference does it make mm -hmm. when all of that pooled mercury, um, it's just a little less heavier than gold. But when all that pooled mercury gets there, it got there um, from those floods. Mm -hmm. yeah. So as far as it atomizing or doing that, so the mercury that I pulled out of there will never be in the river again. Yeah. Um, I found some people that uh, supposedly licensed to it, and I sold it to them. But um, and I think the state did a buyback program there. Yeah, at yeah. one point, yeah, it might have been somebody related to it. I didn't want to tell anybody I even had any mercury, but yeah. you know, so it's kind of funny. Right at that time, again, I won't tell you where I was at, but right at that time, Dave McCracken was going through them accusing him of dumping mercury at his manufacturing place. Wow. Okay, I had 20 pounds of mercury. I quit I quit dredging where I was at. Um, it was somewhere else, but, and right, they were accusing Dave of having mercury that more of it's, and if you broke a, if you broke a um, fluorescent light, wow. the amount of mercury they found was less than that. And here I was, I just gotten out of a river, uh, was 20 pounds. Um, I quit because I, it's just too hard to extract the gold from that mercury, and it, and I don't want to do it. Yeah. I do know that mercury in that form is not harmful. Yeah. So there's a lot of natural occurring mercury in these. Yeah. Um, so you think about where I was at. If a forest fire went through there and hit that cinnabar rack going up the hill, it would melt all of that mercury. And then when a flood came, it runs into the river. I mean, that's how gold gets there. Not that it melted, but maybe yes, maybe no, depending on... Oh, thousands wow. of years ago or whatever but i do know that all mercury in the river isn't from miners yeah so i've just kept quiet where that's at because i don't want i just don't want nobody knowing mm -hmm. where that's at right and uh it's a cinnabar rock mine i still have a half a bucket full of cinnabar yeah. rock that's but i haven't right. extracted okay. anything uh, just to have it you know yeah so, um, what, what kind of impact does suction dredging have on the river, good or bad, in your opinion? What? So, my knowledge, my thinking is this. Um, you dredge in a river, you put your dredge down, you dredge, you dredge, you dredge. I can go a distance from me to you, what is that, 10 feet? If you're doing it correctly, depending on the overburden, how deep you're going. But anyway, let's say you're going to go four feet from from the bottom of the river down and you're only going to do four feet you're only going to do that short of a distance that wide i'm thinking me other people might be better a bigger dredge mm -hmm. or not but let's just say a five inch dredge you can go that distance in again it's just depending on the material you're in you're not looking at a day mm -hmm. you know you've dredged so you know what it's like so you can go along depend on if it's sandy or whatever just to get out of there or you'll move but the impact that you have you're actually taking whatever's there you're taking it out and it's staying in your dredge mm -hmm. so when the next flood comes through every year this happens you go back the next year and it's hard to find where you were at yeah. so um i had to leave a, an area that i love to dredge up above syed uh, beautiful gold out of there and long straight away mm -hmm. so i had to leave that area because of the weather and the time and and you try to mark the trees and everything but try to find that spot the next summer you can't tell you've ever been there yeah was well, when them floods come through, and it doesn't have to be a big flood. Mm -hmm. it, it just, and you know, when you're in a hole, your dredge hole, you're down in a dredge hole, and let's just say it's maybe four feet deep, and your bedrock, and you got your stair step up, and you just lay there and watch it, and you can see the river just you, you, taking it apart, mm -hmm. you know. And, and so when the flood comes through, it just fills it back in. So the impact, is, in my opinion, especially with Claudia and, um, and Joseph's 10-year study, almost zero impact. Yeah. 
I mean, I mean, if, if you're looking at the hydraulic mining that was done here, we still see the impact. Yeah. You cannot the next year see where somebody drilled. Yeah. Yeah. Not with a five inch or a six inch. Mm -hmm. um, as, uh, small scale mining. And what about the salmon? Because I know. There's oh my goodness you know i have i'll tell you it's cool to be in the river dredging when the salmon are coming up the klamath in september so i commercial fished in the summer so i would come here uh, after i got done uh, teaching school when the, uh, i just the, the program i was teaching ended so i would come here in the in the spring and in the fall because it was between commercial crabbing and salmon fishing and i'll tell you in the fall the salmon would come up, and, and at night, you, it sounds like somebody throwing rocks in the water boosh, boosh, from the salmon jumping. And you're down there dredging, and they're coming up, and they're just, they're hardly even as afraid of you. You know, and the, the, um, the, uh, all of the other animals that are, are animals, all the other fish, you know, while you're dredging, you can see them at your nozzle, and they're just down there eating away. So here's what I know about the salmon. In the mornings, so... And you know, because you've dredged, you're in a river, let's say it's 70 degrees, 75 degrees, you go down in your hole and it's 10 degrees colder mm -hmm. in that hole because you're you're down lower than where the sun hits and all of that stuff. So the salmon are laying in those dredge holes yeah. because it's colder yes. and the oxygen coming out of the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, so when I learned that, I would try not to move the dredger a whole lot and I would just kind of get down in the water and you can see the fish in your where you've dredged. Because, and my belief is, is because, so salmon will lay at the bottom of where they're going to spawn. And whenever they get to a certain place, they're behind the boulders they're in. Um, and then they'll go up and then they'll uh, spawn in a tail out. Mm -hmm. But they lay in the deep water until they get ready to go up in, in the shallower water and the tail out. So what we're doing with a dredge, we're actually loosening up where they could be spawning. Mm -hmm. So when they go in and start doing their flipping with their tail, I mean, it's not hard pack. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually their spawning is better. So some could argue that it's beneficial. For the I think it's recovering the streams and let, that allows, if let's say we don't have a big flood. So in let's say 10 years, we don't have a really big flood. The, the ground, the, the underground, um, the bank, the bed of the river packs and packs and packs. And the tail outs start getting a lot of growth on them uh, and packs. So, you know, dredging when you go into an area that has had a flood, it's not too bad. Yeah. You know, there's not a lot of undergrowth and except for the boulders, you know, and, and you think, oh, somebody's been here because it's kind of loose. Mm -hmm. um, um, how, how different is the town, the local area? today say 20 years ago when dredging was really a thing out here and it was allowed i mean what impact have you seen there's the here's economy? the impact with this area you know i told you that that university in la came up here and did it and what they were wanting to do was an area that was one of the richest that became the poorest in the state of california wow. that's this area okay there's two things happen um, that I'm aware of. Number one is the old days, you know, mining ended in the war and all of that. There were, there had uh, s uh, several sawmills, a veneer mill. Um, they So they had their log truck drivers, they had their loggers, because they were managing for sustainability back then. Yeah. So they had tree planters, they had um, all of the, um, um, the people working in the mill, and they had um, they had the restaurants, the service stations they had. Then whenever the mining started, uh, dredging when Dave showed up in 83, I think. So then on top of all of that, they had the miners. So this place was very, very rich. They had people coming from Oregon. They plowed the gray back every year because they had people coming over here working. And then all of a sudden they decided to make this a 600,000 acre national monument. Uh, billions of dollars were put into that and we won't get into that too much, but that group was housed up out of Nevada City, California. And uh, um, all of a sudden, things started tapering off. They, the spotted owl came about, and immediately they started uh, shutting everything down. You can't have a national monument and a viable community. So if you have something, let's say it's just a, a, a cattle ranch, or it's um, a, a little small town, 
then they can say, well, it, it suits the area better to be a national monument. Because in a national monument, you can build in a national monument as long as it deals with hiking or rafting. And we have a lot of hiking around here. So um, they attempted for the national monument, so they needed to shut everything down. So that one document, documentary uh, at the university, um, Sasha was the producer's name, they came up here. They were doing a uh, documentary on uh, from very, very rich to very, very poor. And that's why they chose this area. Wow. Okay. High to low. It was, it was yep. booming at one point. Yep, yep, yep. Wow. And so the, they're kind of doing that with the nation now, I yeah. think. But. Yeah, it's, you see a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, just is there anything else you want to put in on the gold mining? Thing? Yeah, I want to add this. I do little lectures sometimes for high school mm -hmm. students, or I'll take people out and let them mine. And I always ask this question: um, Name one thing you use that isn't mined or grown. One thing, you know. And and a lot of times the kids will say, and adults too, but they'll say, uh, "Water, my drinking water. It's not mined or grown." Do you go down and stick your face in a creek every morning, mm -hmm. or do you turn your faucet on? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I turned my faucet on. Where did the pipes come from? Where did the purification systems come from? I said, did name one thing that isn't mined or grown. Mm -hmm. And if it's grown, mining allowed it to grow. So I said, how important do you think gold is? And most of them will say, oh, it's jewelry and it's coins. And I say, okay, do you realize if I could make gold disappear right now? Let's just say you had the ability to say, right now we're going to make all gold disappear. We'd be in a stone age. Airplanes would crash, spaceships would fall out of the sky, your uh, lights would quit, your video would quit. Um, you couldn't go into a store, you couldn't, the doors wouldn't open and close, your, um, you, no more video games, no, nothing. Because gold, that, maybe they could do something different, but they didn't. Gold makes everything work. Mm -hmm. So your silver, your copper, all of that stuff is coated with gold. And so that allows everything to work. So right now, it's better for the huge corporations that mine in other countries with no rules to shut us down and make you a national monument and to shut us down. We have the best EPA standards of anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. America does. Yet, we're going to shut this down and allow that to go. And I'll finish with this. Uh, uh, there was a, whenever they went through that, um, that study over, I think it was France, I'm not sure. But anyway, they, they were on the, in, the uh, environmental impact in global warming due to human pollution. And what they came up with, and this was a, 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 a the World Federation, some organization, they came up with, you can find it online. What they came up with is if you got every man, woman, and child out of America, when nobody left in America, no cars, no nothing running in America, you would saw you would save the earth at two percent pollution. Because ninety-eight percent of all pollution comes from other places than America. Yet we're gonna shut us down from so you can play your games, you can use your phone, you can run your cars efficiently, but they'd rather have it in other countries where there are no EPA rules. Yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah, that's something. So if something you're using it, on. you're eating it, you're setting on it, you're drinking it, you're taking medications for it, your hospitals are with it, it's because of mining and growing that you're able to do that. Without it, you're in a stone age. And even in a stone age, you gotta chop down a pole to make your hut or whatever. So you had to get the rock and you had to cut the tree down. So it doesn't matter if you're a human and you're going to survive mining and growing. Yeah. And yet they're shutting it down. They're shutting it down for those of us who are, I believe, environmentally conscious. Mm -hmm. Well, you care about the river, I think, probably more than a lot of people. Oh, yeah. I, I really, born and raised, I didn't have electricity until I was like first grade. <laughs> I still have in my cabin, I still have a wood cook stove and all that stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, um, I know that my my parents, you know, they had the farm and they were, my dad's Irish, my mom was, um, so that's Indian. And so I know that we were always taught to respect nature, respect our animals, respect 
and and my dad we had a farm and i was raised on a farm and he was pretty honorary but he always taught you better take care of the animal you better not abuse the animals and if you kill an animal you're going to eat it mm -hmm. and i kind of raised my kids that way not as mean but <laughs> and so we learned right away that take care of it use it but don't abuse it so that's how i was raised awesome